Now I'd like to mention the Lindeberg Central Limit Theorem. So let's start off with the, an increasing deterministic sequence of numbers, nn, that go their integers, that go off to infinity. And let's look at a triangular array of random variables, nm, where m goes from 1 to nn. And now this might be very abstract, so let me draw a little table for you. So suppose that uh, we have n1 equals, say, 2, n2 is 3, and say n3 is 5. So that means that I have random variables x1, 1, 1, and then x1 and 2, and then x21, x22, and x23, and then x31, x32, and x33, x34, and x35, and so on. Okay, so now you see that it's kind of a triangular array. Okay, so this is the kind of random variables we're talking about. Now the assumptions are the following. So each of these random variables have mean zero. E of x and m across all these triangular arrays, so across all this range, is always zero. And they have a finite variance, each of them, which I'm going to call sigma square of n m. This is finite. Okay, but the point is that these random variables are not identically distributed, or not necessarily. They don't have to have the same distribution, they have to be mean zero each, but the variance can be different from uh, n or, or from index to index. They don't have to have the same distribution. However, what we need is that across a line, across a row of this table, they are independent. Okay, so these two are independent. These three are independent, these five are independent, and so on and so on. So every row is a sequence of independent random variables that, that we need. Okay? Now define the sum of these guys as Sn. So I'm going to define Sn as the sum uh, from 1 to Nn of the x and m. So that's the sum of the first row. So if I add up, let's change color here. If, for example, I add up these two, that gives me S1. If I add up these three, that gives me S2. If I add up these five, that's S3, and so on and so on. Okay, so the sum of the rows is Sn. And then I'm also going to introduce the variance of Sn as sigma n square variance of Sn and because the Sn consists of independent random variables added up it is nothing else but the uh, sum of the individual variances on that row. So fix n, fix the row index and sum all the individual variances, so sigma squares and that's what the uh, variance of Sn will be. Okay. So, there is a condition called the Lindeberg condition, and that is condition, which I still need, is that if I look at the sum across a row of the expectation of the x n m squares, which is the same as the variance so far, because they are mean zero, however, I want to put this on the event x and m is larger than epsilon sigma n. Sigma n, again, is the standard deviation of rho n, and I want x and m to be larger than epsilon proportion of that, then for every epsilon, this has to go to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay, that's the Lindeberg condition. As n goes to infinity, this, uh, oops, I forgot something important. Uh, this over 
the variance of that row sigma n square has to go to zero okay so that's the that's the Lindeberg condition so under these conditions okay so let me just uh, put up here that this is Lindeberg's theorem and under these conditions so again the main point is that we have a sequence of uh, random variables added up but they don't have the same distribution they are independent but don't have the same distribution we have the Lindeberg condition under that condition we have a CRT for SN so then the conclusion is then if I look at SN divide by the standard deviation of SN which is sigma n then this will converge weakly to standard normal so the probability that this is smaller than a as n goes to infinity is standard normal probability and this is for every a okay so that's Lindeberg's theorem now before uh, I show you an example I want to comment a little bit on the Lindeberg condition so what is the Lindeberg condition uh, if you look at the square of sigma n m so in other words the variance you don't see that but that's the variance of x and m that's how that was defined okay over sigma n square what is that well that is the variance or the second moment it's mean zero so it's the same x and m square okay over sigma n square now I want to break up the second moment into two cases as usually with indicators so x and m might be larger than epsilon sigma n or it might be smaller so expectation of x and m square x and m in mod might be smaller than uh, smaller or equal epsilon sigma n so these two indicators add up to one so it just broke up things according to a law of total probability and the Lindeberg condition says that if I sum up the first part in m then this goes to zero okay now the left hand side summed up the left hand side summed up will give me one because the sum of the sigma n m squares is sigma n square so if I sum up the left hand side that's one summing up the first bit of this right hand side according to Lindeberg condition is zero so that essentially means that summing up the second side is going to one in other words the second moments come from the case where the random variable is smaller than epsilon times sigma n that's the relevant case the case when the random variable in mode is larger than epsilon sigma n is irrelevant in the limit no random variable can be a measurable or measurable proportion a positive proportion of the total variance that's what this condition roughly says okay so no individual random variable is allowed to take up an epsilon proportion of the uh, total variance <laughs> if that happens then of course we don't have the CRT if one of the random variables has some distribution and it takes up a, a macroscopic proportion of the variance then there is no reason to hope for a CRT then, then the thing shouldn't converge to normal individual variance it should be small and that's where we have uh, the Lindenberg central limit theorem okay I want to show you an example on the Lindenberg CRT uh, first I mention a non-example which I'm not going to discuss here in detail if any of you knows what the coupon, coupon collector problem is then you can work out some details there for the waiting times of new coupons and that turns up not to satisfy the Lindenberg condition and in fact there is no central limit theorem for the coupon collector problem for the waiting times of, of the coupons um, check that if you wish here I want to show you an example of the records of random variables okay so let yi be iid and let's assume for simplicity that they have a continuous distribution absolutely continuous in particular uh, no take any finite number of them 
the probability that two of them agree is zero. So there are no ties. And then let's, let me uh, draw you a picture here. So these are going to be the values of the yi's, and this is i, so i1, i2, i equals 3, 4, and so on. Okay, and maybe the first one, so these are the random values of the yi, maybe the first one is, say, uh, 2.1. Okay, let's put 2 here and then say that this is 2.1. Uh, maybe the second one is 0.8, the third one is a little bit higher, the fourth one is even higher, the fifth one is small, and the sixth one is, say, maybe even higher. So these are IID, they have the same distribution, they are completely random. Now, <coughs> I want to consider the records. Okay, so these, was, these were the YIs. I want to look at the records. So define II to be the indicator that YI is a record. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that yi is larger than the largest of anything before. So the maximum from 1 to i of the yk. That's what it means that we have a record. i1 is always 1. The first guy is always a record. In this case, i2 is 0. Okay, i2 is not a record, it's not larger than anything before. i3 is 1, we have a record, it's larger than things before. i4 is 1, i5 is not a record, i6 is a record. Okay. Now here is something very interesting with these indicators. These indicators are independent. And that's not so straightforward to see. So the sequence of i1, i2, i3 and so on, these guys are independent. Why is that? It's not so easy to see that i, say, 6, is independent of the previous ones. However, it's actually much easier to see that the sequence of records from 1 through 5 is independent of i6. Why is that? Because if i6 is a record, that tells me that everything beforehand is smaller than or equal than this value here. Okay? Given that they are still equally likely to be in any par particular order. And the order is the only thing that matters for records. So the, or the, the fact that the second one is uh, order, the, the second one is smaller than the first one, the third one is larger than the, fir the first two, the fourth one is larger, and so on and so on, that all depends on the order of these random variables. Okay? So records, if we, if we fix the values of these random variables, because they are IID, every order is equally likely. And therefore, the record distribution does not depend on what the actual height is. If I fix the height, if I fix that all of these guys must be smaller than this value here, in other words, if I fix the event, if I condition on the event that uh, i6 is 1, so I have a record at number 6, that only tells me that all of these guys are smaller than before, but it doesn't change the distribution on in which order they come. They are still coming in equal uh, chance for any particular order. So whether I have a record here, meaning that all of these guys are smaller, or I don't have a record here, meaning that at least one of these guys is larger, doesn't change the fact that they come always at a uniform random permutation. Okay, and that's how you can see independence. So these are independent Bernoulli's. Indicators are always Bernoulli's. Okay. Now, what is the parameter of these Bernoulli's? What is the probability that uh, i6 is 1, that the 6 random variable is a record? Well, that's that the largest of 1 through 6 happened at the last time. So this is 1, i6 is 1, exactly is the event that the largest out of the first i y's is the last one. What is the probability of that? The probability of that is 1 over 6, or in general, 1 over i for i i. The probability that this is a record is that out of the first six guys, the largest one happens to be at the end, and that has probability 1 sixth. Okay? So we have independent Bernoulli 1 over i's. Okay? What is the expectation of the i i? Expectation of Bernoulli is just the parameter p, which is 1 over i. What is the variance of ii? 
is parameter times 1 minus parameter. So 1 over i times 1 minus 1 over i. Okay. Do we have the Lindenberg condition? So we have independence, all right, across, across the row. What is a row? Well, a row is when I look at the first n of these i. So when I have n random variables, that's going to be a row corresponding to the Lindenberg theorem. Okay. So we have an independence across rows. What we have just calculated the sigma square, so this would be sigma i square. That would be what I can call sigma, uh, sigma actually, uh, well, let's call it sigma n i square, if I want to be consistent with my notation, where i is uh, less than or equal to n. Okay, so these are the individual random variable variances. All right. So what is then sigma n square? What is the sum of these variances from 1 through n? What is sigma n square? Uh, I don't have a closed form for that. Because if I do a sum from 1 through n of 1 over i, 1 minus 1 over i, then I don't have a closed form for that. However, for large n, this behaves asymptotically like the following. For large n, if for small i's I can get some finite contribution, but as i gets very large, then 1 over i goes to 0, so 1 minus 1 over i goes to 1, and essentially I'm summing up 1 over i's. The sum of 1 over i from 1 through n is asymptotically close to logarithm. So this grows asymptotically as log of n, natural log of n, and the individual variances, of course, 1 over i, uh, 1 minus 1 over i, these are, of course, always bounded by one fourth. No Bernoulli can have variance larger than one fourth. So if I look at now the Lindenberg theorem, then you can easily convince yourself that it's trivially true. For large n, this will be log of n for any epsilon. This event can simply not happen because epsilon times log of n will never be uh, smaller than the Bernoulli, which is 0 or 1. So the Lindenberg condition is trivial. Eventually, all of these summons is 0. So Lindenberg condition holds. Uh, we have sigma n square is log of n. Uh, we have to make the Bernoulli's mean 0, or otherwise we have to subtract the means. So the expectation of the Sn is, again, the sum from 1 through n of the expectation of the Bernoulli's. We have to subtract them. That, again, is asymptotically the sum of 1 over i. Expectation is 1 over i. So that's, again, asymptotically log of n. And therefore, the Lindenberg theorem tells us that we do have a CLT, although a little bit strange form. We look at Sn. We make them mean 0 by subtracting this asymptotic mean, at least a sim approximately mean 0, and then we divide by the standard deviation, or square root of the variance, which is again log n, and this will converge weakly to standard normal. That's the uh, Lindenberg theorem in this case, right? Because so if I divide uh, Sn, it has to, I have to make it mean 0, which is not the case with Bernoulli, so that's why I subtract log of n, the mean of the Sn's, asymptotically at least. So if I divide by sigma n, which is uh, the square root of sigma n square, then this will converge weakly to standard normal.